Oh, well, it's so great to be with you this morning, and this is actually our 12th week in the book of James in our series called Defiant Joy, and today we come to the most highly contested and debated section in all of James. It deals with sickness, it deals with sin, it deals with prayer, it deals with healing, and they're all kind of wrapped up together. And many people have understood this section many different ways. Uh, My father is a physical therapist. He's been a physical therapist for 45 years now. And when I was a boy, he had his own practice. And so every so often he was hiring a new physical therapist. And uh, at one point he hired a physical therapist, a young guy right out of PT school. And he actually lived with us for a time. And this dude was awesome. And he actually drove a purple Isuzu Amigo. Anybody know this? Oh, he was so cool. I was like, that's the car I want when I turn 16. And um, he had been working for my dad for a couple of years. And it was found out that he had a brain tumor that was inoperable. Uh, He had recently gotten married. He had a little baby girl on the way. And he came from a strong faith background, his wife and her family from a strong faith background, and my family, strong faith background. And as he went through this process, knowing that it was inoperable, we all prayed as fervently as we could that God would bring healing to this man, that would miraculously heal him from this inoperable condition. And God didn't. And just a few days before he died, while he was in the hospital, my family and I were in the hospital, and his wife and her family were in the hospital, and they turned to us and said, he is dying because of you. Your faith is not as deep as ours. Your prayers have not been as fervent or as faithful as ours, and you're responsible for his death. That messes with you as a young boy. A conversation like that messes with you even as an adult. Now granted, they were suffering and frustrated, and so were we, but they said what they said because they had a staunch faith-healing theology, and one of the passages that they drew their theology from was the passage that we're going to be looking at today. So it is full of emotion, There is a lot of pain in connection to this passage, but this wasn't James' intention whatsoever. He wrote this section in order for it to be hopeful, helpful, and healing for those who needed it. And over the last few weeks, that has been my prayer for our time this morning, that it would be hopeful, helpful, and healing to those who need it. But we've got to do some significant work in understanding the original context so that we can bring it faithfully into our context today. And so with that in mind, I'd like to invite you to please stand for the reading of God's Word. And if you can't physically stand, please stand in your heart and just listen to these words from James chapter 5 says, are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. And anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. A prayer of a righteous person, when it is brought about, can accomplish much. Elijah was a human being like us, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth yielded its harvest." My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and is brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save the sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude 
of sins. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God. You may be seated. And some of you are thinking, good luck with that one. (laughs) All right. Well, let's first of all be reminded of what this letter is all about. Okay, so first of all, this is written by a guy by the name of James. This is the brother of Jesus. James became the leader of the church in Jerusalem. This letter was written to Messianic Christians, so Jewish believers in Jesus, in the diaspora, meaning the areas outside the land of Israel. So it's written to a number of different Jesus communities of the Jewish people. It is arguably, or people believe, it's the earliest book or letter written in the New Testament, somewhere probably in the mid-40s. And unlike Paul's letters and Peter's letters, this seems to be a letter where James is responding to issues and questions that have arisen in the Jewish Jesus communities in the diaspora that they need help in understanding what to do with. And so some people see 11 sections, some people see 12 sections of James addressing all of these different issues in the letter of James. And so we come to the issue today, which is that there are some who are sick in the community, and the question is, what do you do in those extreme circumstances? But that's not where James begins. He kind of has this little kind of easy roll in to the major issue he's going to get at, But what he says isn't wasted. There's something significant in everything he gives. So notice how he begins. He says, are any among you suffering? Now the word suffering here is the word kakapatheo in Greek. And it's a word that doesn't necessarily mean sickness. But when we hear suffering, that's what we typically think. It's actually a word that means to suffer misfortune, to experience a setback, or bear a hardship. So it could be that someone in your family has gotten sick and you've kind of taken on the weight and so you kind of bear that. But it more often means that you have suffered a misfortune in some way, like a pandemic. Something has happened that there was really nothing you could do about, but as a result, you have found yourself set back, whether it is financially, maybe for some of you frontline workers, it's just an exhaustion. Maybe for some in the community that James was writing to, they were bearing hardship because as a follower of Jesus, now they were at odds with other people in the cities in which they were living, and they may have been losing work as a result of it. And so when James says, if you are suffering, if any among you are suffering, they should pray. And I love this because he said the first thing that you should do is advise them to pray, to go before God, to take it before God, and to ask God for help in how to navigate the situation you find yourself in. See, this is really great advice because sometimes people go through hard times And they actually become discouraged with God and they disengage. And James says, no, engage deeper. So he begins with, are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? And I don't need to put up the Greek word here for cheerful because it literally means cheerful. Okay? Everything is going well. You are not experiencing those setbacks. You are not in a tough situation or circumstance. Things are going well. And James goes, if that is you, then sing praises to the Lord. Celebrate in the good times that things are going well. And he talks about singing praises, which is one way to respond, but basically celebrate. And I also love the fact that James says this because when things go well, the tendency can be to forget God because you don't necessarily need something. So when James starts off, he goes, listen, in the highs and in the lows of life, stay deeply connected to God. And now he gets into the heart of the matter because he says next, maybe, There we go. Are any among you sick? All right, now we need to define this word sick. Because this word actually does refer more to a physical illness. And so this word sick here, asthenio, 
means a debilitating physical illness or some kind of significant weakness. So more often than not, it means a physical illness, but this also could be extreme exhaustion, maybe emotional exhaustion. It could be some other kind of situation where you just feel an unbelievable amount of weakness and you don't necessarily know why. It's debilitating. But more often than not, it is a word that means a debilitating illness. And James goes, okay, so what happens if this is the case? Because when he says, if any among you sick, what comes next is a bit perplexing. They should call for the elders of the church. Who are the elders of the church? They're the spiritual leaders in the community. But if this is a physical illness, then why not call the doctors? Why call the elders of the church? There are elders that will go, hey, you can give me a call, but I can't help you because I'm not a doctor. And this is one of the things that people have missed in interpreting this passage appropriately, is that the assumption is that doctors have already been called. Uh, Douglas Moo, who is arguably one of the most respected voices in the scholarly community around the letter of James, addresses the problem that has come out of this passage, which is that people have looked on this and said, okay, well, apparently the first thing you're supposed to do is you call the elders of the church, meaning disregard the doctors. As long as you have enough faith, God will heal you through the prayers of others. You don't need the medical community because God doesn't need them in order to heal you. And this is what Douglas Moo writes about this particularly. He says, a few zealous Christians insist that God wants to heal his people through prayer and that any recourse to medicine betrays a lack of faith in God's power. But James almost certainly shares the view enunciated by Sirach, to which many of you are asking, who's Sirach? All right, well, this is one of the things that James has been doing all throughout this letter is that he has been drawing upon the wisdom of a few sources. James has been drawing upon the wisdom of Jesus in this letter, primarily from the Sermon on the Mount. The connections are everywhere, but it's not just the Sermon on the Mount. It is other places from Jesus's ministry as well. He's also been drawing upon the wisdom of Proverbs. The connections with the wisdom literature of Proverbs has been all over the place as well. But the other place that there has been a number of connections is what is called the wisdom of Sirach. It's an also called Ecclesiasticus, not Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiasticus, or simply Ben Sirah. This was a Jewish work written in the early part of the second century BC, so let's call it roughly 180 BC, by a Jewish scribe named Ben Sirah. It is patterned after the Proverbs, and it was one of the most widely studied book in both the land of Israel and in the diaspora. It didn't make our New Testament canon, but this is a book that everybody knew. And when Doug Moo says, James is most certainly drawing upon Sirach, here's the passage that he's referring to. It says, honor physicians for their services, for the Lord created them. For their gift of healing comes from the Most High, and they are rewarded by the King. The skill of physicians makes them distinguished, and the sensible will not despise them. The Lord created medicines out of the earth, and the sensible do not despise them. So it's not that you disregard the medical community. The reason why James says is what you should do is you should call the elders of the church. And the reason why you call the elders of the church is because the doctors have already been called and the doctors couldn't do anything about it. And you call the elders because the elders are able to do something the doctors are not able to do, namely address a spiritual issue. There seems to be some kind of a spiritual issue That is behind the physical illness, and the physical illness is being manifested because of something else. Now, this is important to just take a few moments and pause for a moment and skip to the end of the letter of James. Notice again, we recited this, 
And Darren's going to be tackling these two verses next week more in detail, but I just want you to see how this letter ends. It says this, My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and is brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save the sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. End of James. No greetings like Paul does in his letters or Peter does in his letters. James ends with these verses. Now, I don't believe that this is the capstone for our section today. I think this is the capstone for the entire letter of James. And watch what has happened here. Notice these key words. Wanders from the truth, sinner, sinner's soul, multitude of sins. This entire letter has been a challenging letter for us to work through, both as teachers as well as the community, because James has been highlighting all of these sin issues that were incongruent with the way of Jesus, and he is calling the people out on how to confess and repent and get back on track for being who Jesus wants us to be in the world. And so when you see this here, I think this is very important to hold in the midst of our interpretation for our section today, because all throughout the letter, James has been hitting things like getting into, giving into temptation, destructive speech, selfish fights, manipulation, hoarding of wealth, taking advantage of people. This is just a sampling of the issues that he has addressed in this letter. And so I believe that what's going on here in the midst of this is that there is some kind of sin issue or maybe a sin issue that is going on with this person who is sick that the elders have been asked to come in and discern if there is something more going on than just the physical situation somebody finds themselves in. And so when it comes to this, though, one of the things that we have to ask is why is this section the last section? That's what I've been wrestling with because here's what I have learned. 66 books of the Bible and every single book of the Bible has a stunning literary design. The authors didn't just haphazardly put their books of the Bible together. It was almost as if they had a little bit of help. It's brilliant. And I don't think James just, you know, said, well, these are the issues I want to talk about. Eeny, meeny, money, mo. you go first, you go second. There is a progression. And I think that what's going on is that James has said, I have handled all of these issues of sin. And now there are going to be some of you in your community who are not going to confess and repent from the things I've talked about. And they're going to find themselves in a very bad physical predicament. And the elders are going to need to come in and discern if in fact there is a sin issue behind this, or is it they're just sick? So it might be the situation, it might not. And that's something to hold very, very uh, clearly as we look at this passage, is that sickness doesn't equal sin. Okay? It doesn't. But it may. That's what the elders are trying to figure out. And one of the things is that this is consistent with theology in the entire Bible. There are some times that there is a sickness that has nothing to do with sin. In fact, one of the most notable places where we see this is with Jesus and his disciples in John chapter 9. Check out this story. It says that as Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth... His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, "Uh, neither, Uh, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. So there's a situation, the disciples go, okay, who sinned? Jesus goes, neither. But God's going to work powerfully in the midst of this situation. But there are other times when Jesus is healing physical and sin at the same time because they're connected together. So again, sickness may not, sickness doesn't equal sin, but it may. And that's the unique situation that James is addressing in this passage. 
So he says, okay, so any among you sick, they should call for the elders of the church. Who calls for the elders? The person who is sick. Not the parents, not the friends, not the siblings, the one who is sick. They call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, technically or literally, it's having anointed them. So the elders come in, they anoint the person, and then the elders pray over that individual. Now, oil has a lot of uses in the ancient world. In the biblical narrative, it is almost always symbolic. That when you anoint something, you are setting aside someone for special consideration from God. This is a unique situation where the elders come in, they anoint the person with oil, the oil doesn't do any healing, it is symbolically to say, God, we are setting this, uh, this person aside for your special consideration. Help us figure out if there is something more going on here than just what they're experiencing physically. And so they're going to pray over it. And then what happens? Verse 15. Oh, verse 15. This is a tough verse. The prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. I don't know about you, but when I read that, it feels very transactional. If you do this, then this is what you get. That's not what's going on in the context. The prayer of faith is the big interpretive aspect of this verse. What is the prayer of faith? Well, James is going to go deeper into this in a couple of verses. So hang with me. But let me explain the circumstances and what seems to be the prayer of faith. Because this is what unlocks the healing if in fact God chooses to heal the person in this moment. The elders have been brought in. Why? Because someone is going through a debilitating sickness or weakness and they don't know what to do. The doctors have done what they could. Nobody can figure out what's going on and the elders have been brought in. What do the elders do? They come in to the person's home. It's a private environment. It's not out in the public square. And together, they gather around to seek the face of God, to say, God, is there something else going on in this moment that we don't understand or the person doesn't understand? And the idea is that as the elders collectively go to God in prayer, they're asking God to reveal, is there anything going on here? And God may give to them a sense of there's actually an issue behind this physical ramification. Or the individual during that time may go, God has given to me what has been going on in this situation, and they share that with the elders, or the person finally confesses something they have been harboring for a very long time. There's a number of different ways this thing could come out, but the idea is, is that somehow, in some way, what has been manifested is that there has been an issue, and now the elders, or an elder, prays a prayer of faith, meaning praise the prayer on behalf of the sick, and if God grants them the awareness of what's going on, and they pray for it, and God wants that person healed, then the Lord raises them up, and they will be forgiven for their sins because that's what's going on in that moment. Now, I know for some of you are like, I'm going to need to listen to this part of the sermon again, okay? Hang with me because he's going to explain it a little bit more. But here's what this passage is not saying. This passage is not saying that prayer equals healing. It doesn't say that if you just have enough faith, you're going to get the results that you are looking for. A few months ago, it was a Friday night. I was speaking for several days in Denver. I came off stage. My wife sent me a text and said, call me as soon as possible. 
never a good text to get. I called her up and she informed me that one of my best friends, 36-year-old Larry Largent, had just passed away. Now here's a photo of Larry and I in Turkey a few years back. Uh, Larry and I met in Jerusalem when we were studying. We ended up being um, roommates for all of our field studies together. And God just knit our hearts together. And Larry became one of my best friends. Uh, Two and a half years ago at the Mayo Clinic, he was diagnosed with a very rare form of dementia called frontotemporal dementia. For any of you who know about this rare condition that there is no cure for, it is devastating. And it's very devastating if you're contracting it at a young age, like in your 30s. He was 34 when he got this. And so from almost two years from the moment he was diagnosed to the day he died, we prayed fervently that God would heal Larry. And God didn't heal Larry the way that we wanted God to heal Larry. Larry's healing came in a different way. He is with Jesus. And it has been a hard, hard reality to swallow though. Because friends, we all know that death is coming to us all. Death has like a 100% success rate. There is a reason why nobody's 150 years old. What makes it so hard is when it comes earlier than what you expect it to. And Larry is just fine. He is with Jesus. The heartache comes to his wife, his three little girls, and friends and family who are trying to live without Larry. That's the heartache. And there is disappointment when God doesn't do what we want God to do. But friends, there is no guarantee. Prayer does not equal healing. But it may. At the same time that my wife and I are mourning with Erica for the loss of her husband, one of my other friends, her husband gets in a hang gliding accident, literally goes straight into the mountain, ends up at one of the best hospitals in the United States, and over the next several days as people are praying, the craziest, strangest things happen, and the best doctors in the United States go, we cannot medically explain all of the things that are happening in this guy's body, and it is a miracle after a miracle after a miracle. And the tension is, on one day, I am burying one of my best friends doing his funeral, mourning with his wife who's lost her husband, and the next week, I'm talking to one of my friends who's celebrating the fact that her husband is still with her. We all have these stories. Prayer can change things, and you pray your heart's desire, but there is No guarantee. But the elders have been brought in to figure out, is there something more going on here? And if God has given the awareness that there was something else, and the elders pray that prayer of faith, then that person gets up and experience healing. Whether it's in that moment, the text does not say, or whether it comes over the next several weeks, it does not say. But this is the context for what's going on here. Now James is going to go a little bit deeper because they're probably doing the same thing like some of you are doing, like scratching their heads going, how does this work? And he goes, okay. Therefore confess your sins one to another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. I want to come back to this because I think he's now just speaking to the community as a whole. It's not confess your sins to the elders because his whole point is don't let it get to that place. Don't let sin run its course that you get into an extreme situation that requires the elders to come to your house to address this. Confess your sins one to another. But then he says this, a prayer of a righteous person, when it is brought about, can accomplish much. Okay, now some of you who are following along on your phones or your tablets or a Bible or you're at home and you're going, okay, That is very different than my translation. For this particular sermon, the passage or the the, the translation that we've been reading from is the New Revised Standard Version. Stunning translation. But what I've done here for this particular verse is I have used the New American Standard Bible 
their brand new translation update that came out at the end of this last year, the NASB 2020, because what they have included here is something that other translations have been wrestling with for years, and most of them footnote it. They finally said, we think we have a better way of actually representing it in the text. For some of you, you are reading your translation right now, and it says the, the, the effective prayer of a righteous person is powerful, or the prayer of a righteous person is effective and powerful. The word effective there is in the Greek what we call the middle voice. It is reflexive. I know for some of you it feels like it's going like this. Just hang with me. It's reflexive meaning it has been given to someone. So the idea of what they're representing here is the prayer of a righteous person, when it is brought about meaning, when it has been given to them, i.e. God has given to them what they are supposed to pray, then it will accomplish something powerful or it will accomplish much because God has revealed his will and you praying out God's will, God responds in the midst of that. It's actually an amazing idea that the God of the universe who can do whatever he wants, wants to work through us to bring about his purposes in the world. And in order to clarify this point, James does something utterly brilliant. He brings in Elijah. And remember, he is writing to a messianic community, Jewish believers in Jesus. Jewish people know their Bible forwards and backwards. And so he says this. He says, Elijah was a human being like us. That's important. He's not saying Elijah has power that we don't have. He says we're in the same boat as Elijah. But he's explaining this whole process of God revealing his will and praying it out. Elijah was a human being like us and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth yielded its harvest. This is from 1 Kings 17 and 18. Elijah at one point says, there's no rain and it stopped raining. And you go, okay, did Elijah have this amazing power to turn on and off the faucet of the heavens? No. And they know their text and they know the context. There are several passages at play. I want you just to write these down because I don't have time to take you to them, but I'm going to summarize them. Deuteronomy 11, 16 to 17. Deuteronomy 28, 12. And Deuteronomy 28, 22 to 24. Three places in the book of Deuteronomy, right before the Israelites go into the promised land, that God says through Moses to the people, if you are disobedient and you turn away from me, there will be drought in the promised land to wake you up to the fact that you have turned away from me. But if you are faithful to me or if you repent, there will be rain in the land. This concept was so significant that when Solomon was praying at the ribbon-cutting ceremony of the temple in 959 BC, he included this idea in his prayer when he prayed this to God. When the heavens are shut up and there is no rain because your people have sinned against you, and when they pray toward this place and give praise to your name and turn from their sin because you have afflicted them, then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your servants, your people Israel. Teach them the right way to live and send your rain on the land you gave your people for an inheritance." See, when we go to this story in 1 Kings 17, and it says in verse 1, Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Why does Elijah pray that? Because he already knows the word of God. The people have turned away from God. Elijah's situation is this. We are within a hundred years of the ribbon cutting ceremony in Jerusalem where Yahweh is hailed as the God of the people and a hundred years later, Baal is now the number one God in the land. 
And Elijah's responsibility is to confront this evil that has penetrated itself into the people of Israel. And so we have this story at Mount Carmel in 1 Kings 18. Some of you know this story. Elijah calls the people of Israel. The Baal prophets are there. And he begins his speech and he says to the Israelites, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, serve him. If Baal is God, serve him. And then he has the bout with the Baal prophets to demonstrate that God is the only God. And as a result of what happens at Mount Carmel in 1 Kings 18, the people repent of their sin. They turn back to God and Elijah goes, and now here comes the rains. Why? Because that's what God had said. And this is what I believe is going on in this passage is that when it says that a prayer of a righteous person when it is brought about can accomplish much is that when you are discerning with God, God gave Elijah what to pray for because it was in line with God's will. And when Elijah prayed it, it came about, but it came about through understanding what God wanted. And this is what I believe is going on in our passage today. That this is what James was admonishing the people to do. He was admonishing them to get together and discern what God might be saying. To discuss where they were off track. To confess to one another their faults and failures. And to pray for one another so that sin wouldn't continue to mess up their lives. Does that make sense? This is what I believe is the context for the passage for what James is doing. He is dealing with a particular situation, an extreme case that was going to baffle the people. And early in the Jesus movement, he is giving wisdom and direction on how elders are to come together and to discern if there is in fact more going on than just the physical illness. And James' assumption is in some cases, that is exactly the case at hand. So that's the context for that. And now the question becomes is what does it look like to now faithfully move that into our context today? What in the world do we do with a passage like this? Well, again, remember, James' intention was is that this was supposed to be hopeful, helpful, and healing. And in this, he speaks to several different groups of people. And so that's what I want to do. Is I want to walk through the groups that he has talked to and just offer some thoughts around that. So to the first group, to the suffering. To those who are experiencing a setback. To those who are bearing hardship. To those who just feel like, man, things are not going the way that I wanted them to. And by the way, your bracket being busted does not constitute that. All right? (laughs) Is to go to God in prayer. To ask God for what you want. To pray your heart's desire. If you want your circumstance to change, ask God to change your circumstance. But do not allow your prayer to be incomplete because God may not change your circumstance. He may want to change you in the midst of the circumstance. And so part of the prayer in going to God is, yes, God, this is my situation. This is my hardship. This is my setback. Will you change my situation? But if not, what do you want me to learn in the midst of this situation? Because what you may think as a, is a setback may actually be a setup from God for something he's going to do with you soon. And that's not just like a little catchy thing. This is often how God works. God sees your situation more often than not differently than how you see your situation. And one of the ways that you go to God in prayer is to say, God, give me your eyes for how you view this setback and what do you want me to learn in the midst of it? If you are suffering in some way, James says, go to God in prayer. Dig in deep with the God who loves you 
and walks with you in all phases of life. To the cheerful, to those of you where things are going well, bless God, sing songs, and celebrate that things are going well. Listen, if we spend as much time in our energy going to God when things aren't going well, then let's use that same amount of energy to celebrate with God when things are going well. You know, something John Tyson said two weeks ago in the midst of the pandemic is that there are a lot of people who have done just fine. I was talking with a couple just a couple weeks ago, and I said, hey, you guys own a business? What does COVID look like? And they said, listen, we have done incredibly well in the midst of COVID. We have nothing to complain about. And I said to them, bless God for that somebody's got to do well in the midst of this mess. But I said, listen, God has allowed you to do this. Celebrate that. And they said, we have to be really careful about who we share this with because so many people are going through a hard time. And I understand that. But one of the things that I would say is that if things are going really well for you, like don't hold back the joy that God has brought into your life, but go a little bit further and go, God, what do you want me to do as a result of what you have gifted me with in the midst of this season? How can we be more generous to people who are in need because you have given us so much in the midst of these circumstances? If you find yourself today in the cheerful category, the question you get to ask is, God, is there something you want me to do to bless someone who is not doing as well as I am? To the sick or in weakness. Maybe for some of you, you're not even here today because you can't get out of bed. Maybe for some of you, you are here and you're going, I have been dragging for a while and I don't know what in the world is going on. Maybe your response is to call your community group over to your house. To call some wise and discerning friends that you just go, man, it just seems like they have a view on things that is deeper, more mature, more understanding than mine. And you just call them to come over and you get some oil and you go, dear God, we are entering into this sacred space. Will you reveal if there is anything else going on here? Maybe there is a sin-related issue Maybe not. Maybe some of you have been hiding the fact that you have been in a bad place for a long time and God may want to bring healing to you. It has nothing to do with sin. God's just waiting for you to open up to some other people and get some other people involved in your life. We are not solitary individuals. God oftentimes works through a community. God wants us to be engaged with one another. What does it look like for you to invite someone in? And then I would just say here to us all, James says, confess your sins one to another. I don't know about you, but I am not generally in the habit of confessing my sins to anyone other than God. And this passage has challenged me. I do do this, but I don't do it enough. And maybe for some of you today, There is something that is in your life and you have not drug it out into the light and you are hiding it and it is hurting you and maybe God's voice to you today is it is time to drag it out into the light. For some of you, you may not have any idea that there's anything wrong. This is one of the things Darren talked about last week is do you have that person in your life that you can ask, are there any blind spots in my life because you don't see it precisely because it's a blind spot? That one of the things that on occasion I do, and admittedly I need to do it more, and this passage has challenged me with that, is that I will go to my wife or I'll go to one of my best friends and I'll go, hey, is there anything that you see in my life that isn't of God that I might not be aware of that you've been holding back to say it to me because you think I might be upset that you'll actually bring it to my attention? What does it look like for us to confess our sins one to another? Because sin is the great enemy of our lives. It's what can mess 
everything up. And I love what John, who James and John probably spent a lot of time hanging out together. John will write in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And the way that this is true is because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross and in the empty tomb.